Romans 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. It's God's word. Good morning, everyone. So these are great verses that we're going to hear about today. And I have taken Dave's favourite verses off him. <laughs> um, so I want you to listen this morning as I tell you a story. It's a story about assurance, a story about adoption, a story about family and a story about an inheritance. Sometimes when I read the Bible, I can distance myself from the words, like it's for someone else. I acknowledge it and I can agree with it, but somehow I don't absorb it to be for me. Sometimes that might be because I don't feel worthy. Sometimes that might be because I think I know better than what I'm reading or hearing. But in these verses today, we really need to absorb them because we're told of our new identity and our new family. And these verses are our story together, my story and your story. And as we start these verses in um, verses 12 to 17, I feel like we're again drenched in the glorious sun that is verse 1 that we've talked about quite a bit as um, we've Alex started off in verse one and we've mentioned, Dave's mentioned verse one. I think Dave, you said it sits like a banner over chapter eight. And it really does. As I read through, you really do. I'm just going to read those verses one and two again. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. 
just such amazing news that we have there. And it does sit over what we're going to hear about today. We've heard already that Romans 8 is all about grace, a grace that sets us free and gives us a life of victory and hope in Christ Jesus. And as we heard last week, we are saved, we are safe, we have eternal life, all through grace, and we are going to be okay. It is wonderful news. And in these verses today, there's some similar words that we've heard in the first part of the chapter, words like the flesh, the spirit, death, life. And again, we're presented with choices. If you live according to the flesh, if you live according to the spirit. And while there's similar words there, we also have a new theme, our position in God's family. Paul starts here in verse 12, like he is providing a conclusion in a way to what's been said in verses 1 to 11 with the word therefore. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Therefore, we have an obligation. He has told us that the spirit brings life and the spirit lives in us, we heard last week. And so what do we do with that? Paul tells us here we have an obligation, a duty, a responsibility, if you like, to put away the flesh, to put away that hostility to God. We have no obligation to that. We don't owe it anything. Our obligation is that we need to get rid of it from our lives. Sometimes I find all of the, the talk of the flesh and living by the spirit can be a bit confusing because A, we actually live in a sinful world and B, we are all sinners and we know that. So how do we, how do we separate? How do we separate from the flesh and live by the spirit? How do we choose? Can we do a combo deal? No, <laughs> but we often try to do a combo deal. We can decide that some sin is okay and that can just sit alongside in our life with the spirit. It can just sit there together. And sometimes we might actually do that without really consciously knowing it or acknowledging it. And then other times we actually knowingly do it. We actually purposely try and do the balancing act thinking we can successfully divide up our life by the flesh and the spirit, compartmentalize it, if you like. Um, there's some verses in Galatians that, again, just reinforce that those two things can't work together. The verses say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. And that's what we're hearing here in Romans as well. So unfortunately, the message is not, look, just mix it up, a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of flesh living, a bit of spirit living, and just see how you go. The message is clear about what we should be trying to do. We have no obligation to the flesh. We need to put that to death and live fully by the spirit. And yet we still live in a sinful world. We live in the world and we live with sin. But the difference is, I think, just because we live in the world doesn't mean we have to belong to the world. Our identity doesn't have to be found in the world. We live here, but that doesn't have to be where our allegiance is. We belong to God. Our identity is in him. And I know that it kind of sounds like a one-off thing. It kind of sounds like, oh, new life, new, new spirit in you, one deal. It's all done. It's all fine. But it's unfortunately not. It's an ongoing thing for us to live by the spirit. And I don't say that to um, depress us all, <laughs> to make you feel bad. It's actually to remind us that every day we need to remember that we belong to the spirit. We belong to God. We live here, but we belong somewhere else. And so we need to live like that. 
And so we can be led by the spirit. The spirit, of course, leads us towards holiness, helps us daily to put away sin. If we turn our back on sin, big sins and little sins, it's all the work of the spirit in us. And that actually means hard decisions sometimes. It may be choosing what seems like a very boring option when you're out with friends. It may be choosing a confronting option to stand up for Jesus when it's not popular. Maybe choosing to love when, quite frankly, anger or bitterness would be much easier. Maybe choosing to boast in Jesus when boasting in yourself would be much more gratifying. Maybe choosing to say goodbye to a sin that's hanging around because actually you enjoy it and you, you like it. Handing over control and being led by something else is not really a message of our times. We talk about that in kind of negative ways, I feel today. Like if you're talking about someone, oh, like, oh she's being led by those other girls. It's just not good, you know, that being led down a garden path or he's being led off in this way. But this type of being led that we're talking about here in Romans 8, this being led by the spirit, this is wonderful. This is like, this is what we need. We need to hand over that steering wheel and be spirit led. It's hard because we all like the steering wheel. A year or so ago when Tess got her L's, I went out for a drive just in the back streets here in Banks Meadow. Sunday afternoon, fairly safe, quiet traffic. And when we got back, Rolf said, how did that go, Tessie? And Tess just said, it's really hard to drive when mum's holding the steering wheel. <laughs> and I know it's kind of not quite the right analogy, but I hope you can get it. Like, it was hard for her to drive. I was actually holding the steering wheel <laughs> and maybe some shouting. Um, that doesn't work for anyone. It's definitely not safer. Um, Let's not be, yeah, we need to hand over the control. Let the spirit drive. And again, I know it wasn't quite the, maybe not quite right analogy, but we do like to be in control. We do like to hold the steering wheel and we can't always do that. We need to let the spirit control because we're in this new identity. We're part of this new family. And the next verses help us understand it even more. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. We are told that we are children of God, that we no longer need to live in fear. The Spirit doesn't make us a slave to anything. It brings about our freedom, our adoption. We are told we are adopted to sonship. And this word sonship is actually quite important. We need to take a step back. Remember that Paul is writing to a church in Rome that would have had Jews and Gentiles as part of it. And adoption was not that common in Jewish culture, but it was in Roman culture. And it's not always the infant adoption that we might picture in our head. If a man had no sons to pass his wealth on to, he would search for a worthy, um, worthy man or child, could be an older boy or an adult, to hand his wealth on to. And Paul uses a Greek word here, and I'm going to pronounce it very badly, hyothesia, and that refers to the full legal standing of an adopted male heir in Roman culture. So the word describes this process of a powerful Roman family adopting a new heir and their heir having all the full rights of that new family from that time on. And I think when I've read in the past about us being adopted into God's family, I don't always read it quite right. I might have preconceived ideas about adoption and somehow thinking that that is not a fully fledged member of a family. They're, like they're my preconceived ideas, I'm saying, as I come sometimes to read. But now I understand this word 
and what this means, I need to think about it another way. This type of adoption that Paul was referring to, there's no accident here. This is completely purposeful, deliberate. And that's what happens to us with God. He wants us as part of his family, as his children. And he wants us to have the full, fully fledged rights, the full privileges, all of it, as described from that culture back then. And if we believe in God, his son, Jesus, and his death and resurrection, we are adopted into the family of God. And our sisters and brothers in Christ are adopted children as well. What an amazing position we find ourselves in. And then we get a real sense of what that relationship with our father is now that we're part of his family. We, call, we can call God Abba Father. It's not a slave master relationship. He's expanding on that to explain it to us. In our relationship, we can have a closeness with God, a closeness where we can call God Abba Father. And I feel like this would have been a very different way for the Jews of relating to God. Like he's not a distant God now. This brings God very close. Abba is an Aramaic word, a term used for kids to address their dad. It's very affectionate. And we've heard Jesus use these words before in his prayer when he cried out to God, Abba, Father. It's an enormous privilege that we can use those words as well. I think I might forget how amazing this is that we can just converse <clears throat> with God Almighty and we can call him dad. We can use that affectionate term with him. It is incredible. So with this new identity, we have the spirit and we are adopted with full membership into the family and have all the privileges that come with that. And we can call God our dad. And at the end of this section, we get further assurance that we are part of the family and what we receive as a result. Verses say, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are his children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Now, what is this testifying that's going on here? Testifying of the spirit. I've, I, I admit, I actually haven't fully wrapped my head around this. But this is another way that we are assured of our salvation. It's another guarantee. The Holy Spirit, together with our own spirit, testifies that we are indeed God's children. It's another way that we can be confident. We know in ourselves that we are a child of God. We have the spirit inside us. It's a privilege we all have. It's not selective. God doesn't select some children to receive the spirit. We all receive the spirit. And yet the spirit's going to work in all of us differently. But we all have the spirit. And as we sit with that idea, and the idea from the beginning of the chapter till now, we also see that we are heirs with Jesus, co-heirs. And that we have eternal life because we share in his glory. See that at the end of verse 17, we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory, the eternal glory. And so, like, what do we do with all this news, right? These are amazing verses. These, like, we are adopted into a family. We are a child of God. We have full rights and privileges. We have the spirit that lives within us. What do we do with all this? What is our response to this new identity through the spirit and this new family that we have? I feel like it's major fist pumps. You know, it's like, yes, we are a child of God. It is amazing. And we are free as a child of God. Those verses that Al mentioned earlier from Corinthians, we are free. And then like the fist pump gets a bit 
just a little bit less when we look around and go, yeah, but I might not choose this family, like maybe all these, but maybe that person that like, yeah, would we choose all of that? Maybe not, but that's the point. That is exactly the point. We do not choose who is in God's family. God chooses who is in God's family. And thinking about my standing as a child of God reminds me that I need to think more about my relationship with him, but also my relationship that I have with all of you. How do we treat each other in God's family? How do we treat each other in this family that we're in? And where do we belong, this family? There's many verses that tell us how we should treat each other as a family, how we should put others ahead of ourselves, serve each other. Be patient with each other. We're given a long list, actually, about the fruits of the spirit. If we could kind of like do all of those to each other, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and just that little one at the end there, self-control. If we could do all of that with each other in our family, what an amazing family we'd be part of. And we do. We try. So we do need to think about how we treat each other in this new family. And where do we belong? Like we all want to belong to something, don't we? That's something that's just in us as humans, I think. It's how we're built. We want to feel a sense of belonging. And sometimes we need to reset that focus. Yes, we have a new identity and a new family, and that is actually where we belong and our home. Good news is we have a home waiting for us in heaven. We're told in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, for we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. It's such, like it's very reassuring, I find, in times of change, uncertainty, wondering about where you fit in the world, in your family even. We saw how different all our families are just from those two little snippets that we saw of families in our church. We're all so different. And where we fit in the family, we're going to feel different at different times. But we are, we don't have to belong here. We can belong with God. We have the spirit. We are adopted as Christian sisters and brothers with full privileges in God's family. We have a home in heaven. What wonderful assurance that is. And I think it is hard sometimes to get a grasp on that when you may have been a Christian for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, right? For me to stand here and say, you have a new identity. <laughs> you have a new family. But you do. And that's something we've kind of got to grapple with all the time. We have. We do have this. There's a lady, um, Fanny Crosby. She was a prolific female hymn writer of the 1800s. And when I say prolific, I mean like prolific, like thousands and thousands of hymns, not just, you know, a few for the local church on a Sunday. Um, one of them she wrote, To God Be the Glory. We've sung that many times and many of you would know that hymn. Um, she was she became blind as an as an infant, I think when she was weeks old. Um, and then her father died, and her mother and her grandmother helped her just be grounded in Christianity and helped her memorize a big chunk chunk of the Bible. And she laid away to the New York New York Institution for the Blind. And in her and 50s, she's she visiting her friend, friend Ella Penelope. I just I just this like one up, one up, and then round, round, round and chat, chat, and they decide to write a song. Um, and, her and, friend, and her friend, her friend, Bibi, writes right the tune. tune. And she, and wrote, she the wrote the words. words. And, 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 you, and you, some, some of you would have sung this song, song, song in the past. past but I think it just speaks to our great assurance that we have through these verses. It's called, it's called Blessed, Blessed Assurance. Assurance. And I'll just read the first, the first verse in it and the um, refrain, the chorus. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Lord of his spirit, washed in his blood. 
this is my story. This is my song, praising my saviour all the day long. And I just think that is amazing. This is our story. This is our family together. Like the song goes, we are family and we are. We have this great assurance. Jesus is ours. We are an heir. We have the spirit and we have been washed through the blood of Jesus. This is our story. We are children of God. Let's pray. Abba Father, thank you for giving us the spirit. Thank you for adopting us into your family with full privileges. We confess that sometimes we live like we belong here in the world. We pray that we will be led by your spirit to put away our own desires and to live in the glorious grace you have given us. Thank you that we have no condemnation because you sent your son. I pray that we can live for you each day with this full assurance of our new identity that you have given us. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>